The safe work practices described in this DVD apply only to HVAC units pushing 480 volts or less. According to NFPA 70E 2009 default tables, troubleshooting, including voltage testing and other traditional work on energized electrical conductors and circuit parts of HVAC equipment pushing 480 volts or less, requires wearing personal protective equipment designated for NFPA 70E 2009 Hazard Risk Category 2. However, you may occasionally run into HVAC equipment pushing 480 volts or less that is labeled Hazard Risk Category 3. This is rare, but when it does occur, affected workers should wear PPE designated for NFPA 70E 2009 Hazard Risk Category 3 or higher and follow additional safe work practices. Before beginning work on any HVAC equipment labeled higher than Hazard Risk Category 2, Check with your supervisor about the additional personal protective equipment and training requirements needed to perform the work safely. In the mechanical service trade, we spend a lot of time around energized equipment. Our work experience, along with our ongoing safety training, keeps us well aware of the dangers of electricity. However, some new protective measures have recently been established. The National Fire Protection Association publishes the National Electrical Codes, known as NFPA 70. The standard for electrical safety in the workplace is referred to as NFPA 70E, which directs us to beef up our protective measures when working on or near energized units. Although electrical shock has always been a common concern, these new protective measures cover protection from electrical arc flash as well. As a professional, you know that accidents happen when people are unaware of the danger or become complacent. To help prevent either one from happening to you, today we're going to talk about the dangers of electrical arc flash and shock and how to protect yourself from them. The good news is that the measures you use to protect yourself from arc flash will also help protect you from electrical shock. Since most of our work involves startup, service work, or maintenance on units pushing 480 volts or less, that's what our focus will be on today. Work on units pushing more than 480 volts requires even greater protection. Let's start by getting right to it. What causes arc flash and electrical shock? Electrical arcs produce some of the hottest temperatures known to occur on Earth, up to 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is four times the surface temperature of the sun. An arc flash occurs when electrical current takes a path it isn't supposed to follow. The current releases dangerous amounts of energy in the form of an arc flash. Arc flash explosions have thrown workers across rooms and knocked them off ladders. An arc flash explosion can ignite clothes from several feet away or even blow them right off your body. The blast pressure on the chest can be higher than 2,000 pounds per square foot. The explosions are loud, too, much louder than the intermittent sounds you hear in a normal workday. If your body is protected from the blast, but you haven't protected your ears, the hearing loss could be severe. Arc flashes in the mechanical service industry are caused by several different things. 70% of them are caused by human error that results in phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground contact. These arc flashes often occur when a conductive tool or a conductive piece of material is dropped and makes contact between two phases or a phase and a ground. 20% of them are caused by equipment failures from things like overheating or worn parts due to poor maintenance or just plain old age. 10% of them are caused by dust, dirt, debris, rust, or moisture, all of which can wreak havoc on electrical equipment. Arc flashes are just flat out dangerous and they aren't the only big electrical hazard we have to watch out for. Electrical shock is also a big concern when working with energized units, and it happens more often than you think. Remember, electricity always takes the easiest path to ground, 
If that path happens to be your body, the resulting current can cause severe injuries or death. So how do we avoid becoming a statistic? Well, there are two big factors in staying safe from arc flash and electrical shock. Observing appropriate protective measures and wearing the right personal protective equipment. Our work on 480 volt units places us in specific categories that guide us to the appropriate protective measures. One of those is the qualified person category, which directs us to the appropriate safe distance or approach boundary from the energized unit. You'll be considered to be a qualified person as soon as you complete your safety training on the electrical hazards associated with your work because you already have the skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of the equipment, including installations. Approach boundaries are determined by information in the NFPA 70E default tables or a company's flash hazard and shock hazard analyses. The boundaries determined from each type of analysis are sometimes different. Just use the more protective of the two established boundaries. As qualified persons working with units pushing 480 volts or less, we're clear to approach a unit with exposed, energized electrical conductors or circuit parts up to four feet away without personal protective equipment. Any closer, and we need to be properly protected from the potential for arc flash and electrical shock. Remember that the approach boundary for electrical shock applies to any conductive objects that you might be carrying as well. But if you keep all parts of your body and any part of conductive objects that you're carrying from coming closer than four feet from the energized electrical conductors and circuit parts in these 480 volt units, you'll be in good shape. Any closer and you'll need to be properly insulated. The NFPA 70E default tables place us in arc flash risk category 2 when working on 480 volt units, but it's risk category 2 with an asterisk, which means a higher level of flame resistant clothing is required. This risk category directs us to use, at a minimum, 8 calorie flame resistant long sleeve shirt and pants and an 8 calorie flame resistant balaclava. 8-calorie flame-resistant coveralls can be substituted for the shirt and pants. Class double zero rubber gloves. Leather gloves over the rubber gloves. Safety glasses. Earplugs. A Class E hard hat with an 8-calorie arc flash face shield. And leather work boots. Flame-resistant clothing is made from specially treated natural fibers such as cotton or wool. Synthetic fibers such as polyester, nylon, acetate, and rayon melt at low temperature and stick to your skin, making a bad burn even worse. You can easily find clothes that are labeled with the appropriate flame-resistant rating. Flame-resistant clothing has to be worn properly to work. Be sure to button all of the buttons, tuck the shirt into the pants, and basically ensure that there's no exposed skin or underclothing that should be covered by the clothing. The rubber gloves are designed specifically for electrical work. Your company will have to have them dielectrically tested at least every six months, but you should check them out each time before you use them. Trap air inside each glove and squeeze it. Check it over thoroughly, looking and feeling for leaks. No matter what type of gloves you use, if there's any damage, even signs of wear like scrapes or scratches, don't use them. And follow your company's procedures for ensuring that no one else uses them either. The leather overgloves protect the rubber gloves from getting punctures and tears and must be worn whenever rubber gloves are worn. The safety glasses are standard issue and must be worn at all times while on the job. The hard hat you need has a special Class E rating. You can find the rating on the inside of the hat. Many companies use Class E hard hats as a standard practice. You may already have one. The face shield is specially designed to protect against dark flash. The calorie rating is also shown right on the shield. The balaclava will protect the skin on your neck and ears that would otherwise be exposed to an arc flash. These balaclavas are lightweight and reasonably comfortable. Also, anytime you're working where it's damp, it may help to increase your resistance with an insulated mat. NFPA 70E does give companies the option of conducting their own flash hazard analyses instead of relying on the corresponding NFPA 70E default tables. A flash hazard analysis is a study to determine a worker's potential exposure to arc flash energy. 
The results determine the level of protection needed to keep the worker safe in a particular application. Your company will determine whether it'll use the 70E default tables or conduct its own arc flash analyses. Now, regardless of your company's approach to hazard analysis, you should never service, make repairs, or perform maintenance work on energized units. Use insulated tools and the proper protective equipment to complete troubleshooting, then immediately shut off the power to the unit, lock it out, and test it to ensure that the power is off before you start the rest of the work. Test your meter on a known live source. Then test the conductors and circuit parts. Finally, go back and test the meter again on the known live source. If there are any inconsistencies or discrepancies anywhere in the process, take the meter out of service immediately and repeat the process with a replacement meter. As the saying goes, it's not dead until it's tested dead. Don't forget to discharge or bleed out the capacitors before you take off your protective equipment. And always stand to the side of the separately mounted disconnects when turning the power off or back on. The good news is, once the unit is locked out and tested dead, you can remove a lot of the protective equipment, as long as no exposed energized parts remain within the minimum approach boundaries. If the unit you're working on has a built-in interlocking disconnect, you'll need to keep all of your personal protective equipment on the whole time you're working. Working safely with electricity is a fundamental part of our job. Protect yourself from arc flash and electrical shock by taking the protective measures we've discussed. Make sure you know the voltage of the units you'll be working on. Pay close attention to the flash hazard and shock hazard approach boundaries established for your specific work applications. Never make repairs on or service energized units. Use only insulated tools and wear the proper flame-resistant clothing and protective equipment while troubleshooting energized units. After troubleshooting, shut off and lock out the power. Then, test it dead and discharge any stored electricity, such as the current in the capacitors, before making repairs or servicing the unit. And finally, remember that work on equipment pushing more than 480 volts requires even greater protection. Make sure you have the proper training and equipment before you proceed. It might seem tough at first, but quite a few mechanical service men and women are already following these new protective measures, and they've gotten used to them. It's almost become second nature. They just do it. Smart people. They figured out that the result of being unprotected from an arc flash or electrical shock could be catastrophic. <laughs>